Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to be here this morning. And we, today is our last day in Isaiah, the prophet. And have you been enjoying our bits and pieces of Isaiah? I love Isaiah. I've been watching on YouTube, dare I say it, a, a program on the Old Testament. And it's been fascinating looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's so much have been dug up. And there's been bits and pieces of every book of the Old Testament, bar one. Isn't that amazing? Pieces, sometimes whole scrolls, like the Isaiah scroll and the Psalms scroll. And there are multiple copies. And which ones do you think would have the most multiple copies? Would it be the book of Esther? Malachi, Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. No. Isaiah, of course. Isaiah. Because obviously the Jews have all loved Isaiah. What would be the second one? Psalms. Yeah. So Isaiah, Psalms, and Deuteronomy. Yes, Deuteronomy. And you think, why? Well, they love the law, didn't they? How they love the law. So here we are. Oh, that says, welcome. See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. What chapter do you think that would be in? <laughs> well, it doesn't say, Gary. <laughs> For those who are out there in television land, Gary is looking at me in this stupid fashion. <laughs> I'm not sure who he is anyway. So the next slide is going to take us to Isaiah 3.24. Oh, it did. Well, that's all right. Oh, where is this from? This is not Isaiah. This is revelation upon revelation upon revelation. And it reminds us, particularly when we come to the Lord's Supper, which is not today, but another day, uh, we love the book of Revelation and we know so much of it off by heart. How about you say these words with me? You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worthy, Lamb of God, for you were slain, and with your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Amen indeed. And we're going to stand and sing the first song, which is Behold the Lamb of God. He walked on earth, showing glimpses of heaven. Who walked on earth? Jesus, showing glimpses of heaven. Let's stand. <laughs> on earth, showing glimpses of heaven, even death, disease, and no heart. The wind and the waves were all beaten before him. Well, may they say, who is this man? Drank 
glimpses of heaven and from Isaiah right through we wait upon this Messiah to come we know his name Jesus and as he comes he shows us what heaven and the life of heaven is all about but sometimes we don't get it so right do we and that's why we confess every week and let's have the words and these beautiful words let's say together Heavenly Father you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and broken your law. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you more and more through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And with the declaration of our sinfulness must come the assurance through Christ of forgiveness. And these wonderful words from 1 John, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so we rejoice in the blessing to know that in Christ, those who repent have forgiveness of all their sins. Amen. Amen indeed. And therefore we can stand and say together the creed. And let's do that right now. And Gary has been encouraging us. Do you know what he's been encouraging us to do? Not to look at the words. And see if you can say it. Now I get muddled up because uh, the Nicene Creed is so similar, isn't it? So I've just got to get that out of my head, that one. Uh, and I'm allowed to look every now and then. Friends, if you want to look, there's one at the back as well. <laughs> so you can look back and front and, and say to others, because we are affirming the faith of the church to each other. Together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, 
God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, everyone. Well done, those who close their eyes or look somewhere else. I was watching, and it's, some of us were concentrating so hard. Well done, everyone. Now we're coming to that important part of our service where we hear God's word and we're going to hear again the Isaiah reading which we've been adding to each week and Lindy has that for us and also Mark 10 and we've got first a prayer and let's say that together. We thank you Heavenly Father for inspiring all scripture by the Holy Spirit, by your Spirit Help us so to hear your holy word that we might be equipped for every good work. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lindy. Morning, all. This week it's Isaiah 6, 1 to 7. In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated, sit, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The New Testament reading is from Mark chapter 10, verse 35 to 45. Mark 10, 35 to 45. This is the request of James and John to Jesus. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first 
must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord Almighty. Thanks be to the Holy God. Now, what sort of response should we have as we read the Word of God together? The next song actually tells us. And the modern songs are very clever. And this one is one of those very, very clever ones because it names us as people of the risen King who delight to bring him praise. Come all and tune your hearts. Do you sing flat? Sharp? Do you need tuning? Does your life need tuning? Ah. To sing to the morning star of grace from the shifting shadows of the earth. Gosh, Australia Day was a bit like that, wasn't it? We will lift our eyes to him where steady arms of mercy reach. Oh, to gather us, his children, in. But what comes next? Rejoice, rejoice. But what if you don't feel like rejoicing? If you've had a hard week, it's been a really bad week, and there's been a death in the family and things are crook. Well, friends, rejoice. Even in suffering, there is joy. There's always some joy. And that's why we need to be together, isn't it? Because otherwise we might be at home and we might say, I've got nothing to rejoice, but I'm a child of Christ. And he's called me to rejoice even in the hardest of times. Not for the hardest of times, but in the hard times there is joy. So let's stand and sing. Oh, that was almost a sermon, wasn't it? <laughs> Gary's nodding his head. <laughs> to bring him praise Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace From the shifting shadows of the earth we will lift our eyes to him Where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children
We've got a new receiver, so hopefully it'll all be okay. <laughs> when Peter was talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, it's interesting that uh, Psalms and Isaiah with multiple copies, and they're, of course, the ones that are quoted the most in the New Testament. In, in a survey a few years ago amongst Jews in New York, which is sort of the place that has the biggest population of Jews outside of Israel, um, people were asked about their knowledge of the Old Testament in various ways. Well, they were asked, do you, do you know about Moses? And, uh, you know, most people, big tick. Do you know about Esther? A big tick because of the festival of Purim. And then they were asked, do you know about Isaiah 53? And most people had no clue about Isaiah 53 because it's one of the clearest passages which points to Jesus. So very interesting um, in the surveys of people in New York. So let me just pray. Father, thank you for revealing yourself and your plans in your word. May we hear and take to heart what you're saying to us through the prophet Isaiah. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. <clears throat> Forgiveness is to human beings the plainest of duties. But to God, it is the profoundest of problems. So wrote theologian Carnegie Simpson in a little book called Fact of Christ. Why is forgiveness such a problem for God? Essentially because it's a collision problem. Collision between divine perfection and human rebellion. Between God's holy nature and our sinful nature. Isaiah summed up the problem in this way, asking, <clears throat> how could God <clears throat> excuse me, both be a righteous God and at the same time a saviour, one who forgives? That's in Isaiah 45. Well, over the last few weeks we've been exploring two very significant truths. The first one concerns the holiness of God. We've seen how the holiness of God drives Isaiah 6 and, in essence, the book. But secondly, we've seen a response to the holiness of God. That is, Isaiah confesses his sin. He can't but confess his sin in the light of seeing who God is. Now remember that chapters 1 to 39, the first half of the book, focuses on the big question, how can a holy God deal with the sinful people. And the essence of the answer through those chapters is through judgment. Otherwise, God's character is compromised and the just consequences of rebellion would be swept under the carpet, you know, the way the men clean houses. Um, it would just be swept under the carpet. Yet as God responds to Isaiah's confession of sin we encounter God's holy love in action as it brings forgiveness. And so we're given a, a sort of like a preview, a window into Isaiah 40 to 66 as it asks, how can a holy God forgive a sinful people without compromising his holiness? The answer that comes in the second part of that book is through the sacrifice of God's sinless servant, a sacrifice offered on behalf of sinners. So come with me once more to Isaiah 6. And if you've got your Bibles there, it'd be good to open it up at Isaiah 6. So we've come to the point where the prophet confesses his sin in the light of the Lord sitting on the throne, his presence fills the temple, in the light of the holy God declared by the seraphim, and he confesses his sin. Woe is me, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. And then God responds with forgiveness. So do you recall the normal means of atonement under the law of Moses? God's people would bring their animals to the temple or buy them around the temple, but bring them there and the priest would sacrifice them. So Isaiah uses altar in verse 6 to sort of act like a shorthand for the whole system. 
Because the sacrifices that were instituted under the law of Moses allowed unclean people, that is sinners, to stand in God's presence as represented in the temple and not die. It was God's provision for a sinful people. Now the altar, of course, was a physical place where atonement was effected through sacrifice. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. You see, without the shedding of blood, that is the image of death, the judgment of death, remember from Genesis 3, there can be no forgiveness. And we're reminded of that in Hebrews. So let's now check out how this forgiveness is enacted in Isaiah 6. So Isaiah initially sees that one of the seraphim with tongs, because it's hot, taking the live, the burning coal from the altar. And then, of course, he experiences this wonderful gift as the burning coal touches his mouth. And this is what is said. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. As that burning, that is that live coal from the altar, touches Isaiah's lips, it symbolises his cleansing, both the removal of guilt and the atonement for his sin. Now, this isn't some ceremonial cleansing of uncleanness. You know? Remember last week when we looked at that passage from Mark 7 about the tradition of the elders and the washing of hands and all that, as if that outward affected the inward. It isn't like that. Rather, it's an atonement for moral uncleanness. In other words, for the sin that, in fact, not only Isaiah, but all of us are accountable to God for. And so as that burning, as that live coal touches Isaiah's lips, we see the effect is instantaneous. Even more instant than instant coffee. It's instantaneous, straight away. And his guilt is immediately taken away. His sin atoned for. But we also see that Isaiah contributes nothing to his cleansing, does he? He's passive in the whole of the episode. He comes empty-handed before the holy God because his sin, his uncleanness, makes any other approach to the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts, totally impossible. Atonement is simply a gift of God, initiated and enacted by the Holy God himself. So God's act here being symbolised with that coal declares that Isaiah's penalty for sin, that is his just judgement, has been paid. Justice has been done. See, it is an act of grace. And God's grace is embedded in the whole Bible because salvation, forgiveness, right standing with God it's always his gracious gift. It's not earned. It's not merited. And Paul in Ephesians 2 highlights that, doesn't he? Verses 8 and 9. Right? We are saved by grace, not by works, lest anyone should boast. Back in chapter 1, Isaiah reminds us that <clears throat> this grace was offered to Israel as a whole, but in their arrogance, in their defiance, they reject God's loving provision. And so Isaiah's cleansing dramatically reveals how God initiates atonement because he's always seeking to restore broken relationships. And as a result, the atonement that he affects removes sin as a barrier to fellowship with the holy God. So friends, as Isaiah experiences cleansing and forgiveness, God calls him to be his to the people of Judah. Let me read verse 8. <clears throat> and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Now all of this links us back to verse 5 and following and, and the mention of lips and mouth just draws us back. Because God seeks a messenger a messenger cleansed and willing to be his mouthpiece. 
right? Remember the, the words coming out of the seraphim, holy, holy, holy. Words which he couldn't echo because his lips were unclean and he lived amongst a people of unclean lips. But now cleansed and forgiven, he can step up to that task. Here am I, send me. You see, God will achieve his purposes of judgment along with salvation through his word. See, unlike Assyria's military power and dominance, God doesn't rule by force or by political manipulation. Rather, God rules by his word, by the revelation he gives to his servants, the prophets. And that runs right throughout the Bible, doesn't it? It starts there in creation. And God said. It's there with Abraham as God's bringing the recreation, so to speak, to begin as he calls Abraham out with a word. It's there with Moses and Mount Sinai, isn't it? As the word of God is delivered in the form of the commandments. It's there with King David as Nathan the prophet brings the word of rebuke to David and then a word of promise about an eternal kingdom. It's there with the prophets as they always begin the, the word of the Lord is. And of course, ultimately, it's there with Jesus, isn't it? The word that steps into our lives. It's there as you read through the book of Acts where it talks about the gospel growing, that is the gospels going out. It's there in, in the letters as Paul says things like let the, uh, the word of Christ rule in our hearts, in our lives. It's there in the book of Revelation, isn't it? Where you time and time again you hear of the word echoed out. God rules by his word. Well, for Isaiah, he gets uh, a sense of the word that he's going to be proclaiming, it, and certainly the sense of effect from verse 9 onwards. The message that he's to preach the people and the effect it will have. It's a message about God's judgment on sin. And that's why, in a sense, Isaiah 6 is not Isaiah 1, because we've sort of got a feel the sinfulness of Judah to see the necessity of the word of God coming out calling people to repent or judgment will come. See, the punishment has been decided in heaven and Isaiah's preaching will put it into effect. So let me read verse 9. Go and say to this people, keep on hearing but never understanding. Keep on seeing, but never perceiving. See, the prophet's ministry, in essence, will reveal the people's spiritual insensitivity, their hardened hearts. Remember last week when we looked at chapter 1, or the week before, one or the other, um, of Isaiah, and about the rebellious children? You know, even the ox and the donkey know their owners, but my children don't know their father. And of course, in the heart of chapter 1 was the failed worship, wasn't it? What is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, the Lord says? When you pray, I will not hear, because your deeds are so evil. See, their pride and rebellion was so deeply rooted in their lives that they'll misunderstand what, whatever truth they hear. Paul echoes the same sort of thoughts in 2 Timothy 3 as he talks about the response of people in our days. And note how God in this discussion here talks about the outer senses, you know, the, the hearing and the seeing, but as along with that with the inner ones of understanding, perceiving. So it's emphasising the total inability to comprehend the message by the people. And the situation is even worse if it's possible. As we see in verse 10 which says, Make the heart of this people calloused and their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So the more Isaiah declares God's word, the more the people will reject it with an ever-increasing hardening of their hearts. Remember when Moses confronts Pharaoh. 
We keep getting that echo, don't we? The heart was hardened. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Let my people go? No way. And the judgment of God had to come for that to happen. In other words, Isaiah is being told the people become so hard-hearted by hearing the truth that repentance will become virtually impossible, resulting in the inevitable destruction of God's judgment. So what a ministry Isaiah is being called to. If I'd have been, minister, if I'd have been Isaiah, I would have sought to do a Jonah, to, to run as far as I could to catch that ship going to Tarshish. <laughs> I'm not sure I would have liked to end up being in the belly of the big fish, but uh, you can see this is an incredible ministry he's been called to, isn't it? But in the light of the vision of the holy sovereign God whose train fills the temple, in the light of the holy God who brings forgiveness, Isaiah can't but obey. And so the prophet is to announce judgment and we can see the hardening of hearts beginning in response to his word, even in chapter 7, the very next chapter, as Isaiah brings the word to King Ahaz, and Ahaz rejects it. Friends, it's very interesting that Jesus quotes these verses when he's talking about the effect of his teaching in parables in places like Matthew 13 or Mark 4. You see, in his ministry, Israel is also being judged, as Paul highlights in 2 Corinthians. And so it'll take God's intervention to soften hardened hearts. And so the key question that Jesus is posing is, in essence, the same as that of Isaiah. Will there be true repentance from Israel as they encounter the message of the kingdom? As we hear these verses, that describes such a daunting ministry for Isaiah, then the question of verse 11 comes as no surprise, isn't it? How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord, will I be preaching a message of judgment? And it must have been very difficult, I imagine, for Isaiah to hear God's reply until the cities lie ruined like we see in the picture. Like ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. Isaiah is, being, is saying, got to keep preaching this message and this message will keep on reverberating until cities and homes and land are devastated, until the people are taken into exile. See, there'll be no reprieve for Judah as God's justice is enacted to its fullest extent. Since God's word of judgment for breaking the covenant, what's often called the covenant curses that we find in places like Deuteronomy 28, is now being fulfilled. <clears throat> Yet if that was all there was, it would be such a bleakness for Isaiah. Yet even here, he has offered some encouragement. In the midst of judgment, there's a glimmer of hope. You know, like a glimmer of light's like, isn't it? You know, when you've got a dark bedroom and someone's left the kitchen light on and there's just this inkling of light coming under the door. Just enough to get you out without stumbling over the dresser. <laughs> See what verse 13 says? Though a tenth remains in the land, it'll again be laid waste. And, but as the terebinth and the oak leaf stumps, when they are cut down, so will the holy seed be the stump in the land. See, Isaiah begins with the vision of the holy God, isn't it? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And now we've been told about a holy seed as the chapter concludes. It is a comforting ray of light and hope. You see, God is saying that after judgment, 
I promise to establish a restored remnant, a holy people unto me. And Isaiah himself, cleansed and commissioned, is a sign of this coming gracious act of God. But salvation will only arise after the judgment on Judah's sin has been completed. And so the picture in verse 13 is a bit like this. It's like a charred stump. But in that charred stump is the holy seed, the promise of regrowth, the promise of a future. <coughs> Out of the fires of judgment on a rebellious nation, there will come a holy seed that will produce a new people of God cleansed and forgiven. In our garden, Christine has been battling the dreaded spider mite that eats and burrows into everything. She's been working on a couple of trees on the front garden. And now, out of what was almost like a dead tree has come these shoots, has come the green and the red starting to flower again. That's the picture here. That out of that stump where it looks like there's nothing left, there is a holy seed to produce a holy people in the long run. And that holy seed points us forward to central aspects of the promised Messiah's ministry. So, for example, in, in Isaiah 11, we're told about the shoot coming out of the stump of Jesse, that is, the line of David, fulfilment of the promises to David in 2 Samuel 7, you see. Isaiah 53, of course, begins by saying that this Messiah will be a tender shoot, yet he'll be despised and rejected. The servant of the Lord is rejected because he takes upon himself our transgressions. He is pierced for our transgressions, a man of sorrow. Friends, the Bible makes it very clear that God rules by his word. His sovereign purpose of salvation through judgment is achieved by God's word. The word he reveals to his pointed messengers, the word he's revealed to us. God's word both promises and brings into effect what he intends to take place. It's just as Isaiah says later on in the second part of the book that his word will never go out in vain. It will always achieve its purpose. And of course that purpose culminates in the word who is God becoming flesh and stepping into our world. As Emmanuel enters, he preaches the message of the kingdom. And that message of Affirms how God's ultimate purpose for both Israel and the world is now being fulfilled in Jesus. Hence, Jesus calls people to repent. How else would the Holy One of God who steps into history not call people to repentance? <laughs> calls them to believe in him for forgiveness, for eternal life. Because Jesus is the only way that people, people can be right with the one true God. The only way to know God and belong to God for eternity. See, Jesus comes to fulfil the prophecy of the suffering servant of the Lord from Isaiah 53. And that second reading that we had from Mark's Gospel, from Mark chapter 10, ends on that note of Jesus' purpose grounded in Isaiah 53. For the Son of Man, even the Son of Man, did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A great echo of particularly verse 12 of Isaiah 53. You see, Isaiah's prophetic ministry anticipates and points us forward to the end time ministry of Jesus but the stakes are so much greater because rejecting the message of Jesus leads to eternal judgment 
Even that well-known, loved verse of John 3.16 highlights that, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And as we accept the message of the kingdom, believing his preached word, that's what enables people to become his disciples and so belong to the holy remnant promised by Isaiah. And again in John 1, John talks about those who believe in his name were given the right, the power to become children of God. And after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, the gospel is proclaimed to the nations, isn't it? He calls people to do that in his last words, isn't it? Make disciples of all nations. And, and so as you open up the Acts of the Apostles, you see that, don't you? Jesus says to them, you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's why I got to Australia. Um, God's blessing of salvation is now reaching every corner of the world, isn't it? And Isaiah 66, 19 is being fulfilled as God's glory is proclaimed among the nations. And it can only take place as forgiveness comes in Jesus. But of course, Jesus' message still encounters both rejection and acceptance, isn't it? That was true for Isaiah, true for Jesus. Remember that incident in Nazareth when, he, when he's at the synagogue there and they're telling the people that what you're reading in Isaiah is fulfilled in me and what do they try to do? They try to shove him off the cliff. And of course, the ultimate rejection at the cross. We see it in the lives of the apostles, don't we? And of course, we've seen in the lives of Christians ever since the effects of both acceptance and rejection of the message. But God chooses to use his word to accomplish his purposes, both of judgment and of salvation. Friends, we are still involved in mission today. It's still our task to faithfully proclaim the gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of salvation and hope. And with that, be praying for God's mercy on all who hear the saving good news. And so the challenge for us coming from both Isaiah and the work of Jesus is really to say, will you stand with Jesus and his mission to the lost. As he says in Luke, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So that's the question, isn't it? Will you stand with Jesus and his mission to the lost? Will you? Yes. I can't hear you. Will you? Yes. It's so important, isn't it? And that's what we're trying to do next Sunday, isn't it? To kick off the year by reminding ourselves of the mission that we have to bring the gospel and to pray. So let's just spend a few quiet moments that you may reflect on where you are in the mission of Christ. So let's just spend a few quiet moments. We stand and sing again as the people of God, that sense of rejoicing. And look at these words we're about to sing. 
there is a hope that burns within my heart. Hmm. Let's stand and sing and enjoy this. come now to our prayers and the first prayer is all about Australia. I got so annoyed with the Australia Day stuff. Oh. Oh. Unspeakable my words. So I put it into prayer. So I'm sorry if it's a bit edgy. A prayer is allowed to be edgy. Yeah, well it is, I too. There's a sharp edge or two. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your creation of this world, including this land of Australia. We praise you for its beauty and its bounty, for mountains and hills and plains, for rivers, creeks and seas, and wonderful variety of animals, birds, and even wombats. Hmm. We praise you for the people to whom you have entrusted this land in time gone past, each one made in your image, all loved by you. We think of their management of the land. We think of their communal life and the strength in that and their culture. We praise you for Christians from many lands who came to Australia, who brought their faith, 
who prayed and read their Bibles, who lived to honour you, who loved their neighbours, who planted churches, who worked for gospel growth. And we thank you for Christian people who tried to defend our Indigenous people, who provided for them, who brought to them the gospel of our Lord Jesus, who translated the Bible into their languages, and who recognised their common humanity. In the words of John Harris, the missionary, we wish we had done more. And at the same time, we grieve their mistakes and ours and any damage they did while trying to do good. And we thank you that Australia has provided a new start for people from many countries in every generation. And we especially praise you that many who arrive with very few resources but have been able to find education and training and employment and have enriched the common life. But dear Lord, forgive us for our sometimes greed, our sometimes worship of money and possessions, even of comfort and happiness, and at the same time neglect of your Son and our salvation. So reform, we pray, and revive Australia. Revive your church. Lord, we want to be a shining light for our nation. We want to serve your will for this country. And we want to bring many to faith, saving faith in Christ. We thank you for the indigenous Christians of our communities. And Lord, we pray that you'd raise up that next generation of leaders in those communities and churches. And today we pray for Brendan and Amy Garlett as they pastor Shoalhaven Aboriginal Community Church, which is a ministry of all saints, Nara. And Lord, we pray for similar churches in Campbelltown and in Mount Druitt. Lord, grow your gospel work, we pray, in all nations, all races. And Lord, we pray for good government, wise policies, justice and equity. And Lord, how we dislike this having to be one or the other, far left or far right, and the sense of destruction that comes. Lord, give wisdom to our leaders to think of long-term use. And please rid us of corruption, incompetence, selfishness, greed, and self-indulgence. And Lord, give us a great spirit of generosity to our neighbouring nations, for we are so rich. And so have mercy on all Australians. Teach us to trust in your Son and our Saviour, to love you, to love our neighbours. And may your name be seen to be holy, sanctified in Australia, and your kingdom come in part here, and your will be done here. And we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. And Lord, we pray for the ministry starting up in our church here. We particularly pray for Caden and Amelia and their teams as they head up the uh, young people's ministry. Lord, give Caden particularly strength and wisdom. We pray for Amanda as her maternity leave is just around the corner and for her and Jonathan as they negotiate the planning and juggling of their responsibilities. And we pray for Bible study groups as they start to. What a rich church we are. And we want to learn more and more and do more and more for you. And Lord, bless Gary's group for witnessing. And thank you for those who are signing up. Give us all a nudge, we pray, where we need our training. 
and Lord, the prayer group to help us in that. And Lord, for next Sunday, we just thank you for this huge opportunity you've given us. Lord, we pray for those neighbours we've asked. Pray for conversations this week. Lord, that it will be a great Sunday indeed. Bless every part of the service and before and afterwards. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And Lord, we pray for our missionary friends. We pray for the gospel in other countries, particularly praying for Myanmar. Thank you for Jill and Richard. Uh, please, we pray for full health for them. We thank you for the wedding last weekend and what joy there was. And we pray for Nick and Keisha also in Peru and pray for them for safety and the going forward of the gospel. And lastly, we pray for those suffering for whatever reason, uh, all these names that are before us week after week in the news sheet, and each are loved by you, Catherine Barnett, Bruce Bishop, Anne and Anthony Bryant, Alan Coombe, Robin and Neville Henry, Helen Langford, Glenn Moss, Horst Ryman, Nikki Roberts, Colin, Cheryl's brother, Herbie Blaine, Diane Pierce, and Thelma Nankerville. And also praying for Rabina Corbett Jones's son Rick, uh, for Sarah, Trish Brody's granddaughter, and for Trudy and Steve Pining. And very lastly, we pray for our new pastor. Give our nominators, our selection panel, wisdom. And Lord, forgive our impatience, but we would really like to know who that person is who's coming to us, and we would like to know now. Lord, the person of your choice, and give us generous hearts as we find out who he will be. And so we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we have a prayer. A prayer for our times. Lord God, you know us to be set in the midst of so many great dangers that by the reason of the frailty of our nature we cannot always stand upright. Grant us such strength and protection as may support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now, Church Family News. Gary. Thank you. Friends, as Peter prayed about uh, programs starting up, um, we still need some more help, for, particularly for the Kids Club, which is Friday afternoons. Um, we, so if you're able to help out in some way, even if it's only being able to come, say, once a month to help with administration with checking in and checking out kids or with uh, afternoon teas or things like that. I'd love to hear from you. Um, but as well as that, uh, I'm still looking for people that may be able to uh, more closely assist Caden as well. So um, please let me know as we try to reform the team as we go on into uh, this year as um, Amanda takes uh, maternity leave and so we want to keep things. I think we've got youth group, I think, just about there, but uh, just keep praying for that. But if you can't help out time-wise, then perhaps you might consider committing yourself to praying for those group when they meet. So Kids Club is roughly 3.30, 5.30 sort of time, and then uh, youth group are 6.30 or so. So it would be great to have a good prayer team. Um, so just keep those things in mind. Okay, heads up for joy next Sunday. Um, 
if you haven't taken any to give away, please do. So otherwise, we'll just have to throw them out. That would be sad. So grab one to give away. Um, so there's two questions. Who are you praying for? Who are you bringing along? And um, don't forget these uh, bookmarks, which encourage us to be committed to prayer. Right? Not just for next Sunday, but ongoing, okay? To keep them before you so that you can keep praying for the people around you that aren't Christians, okay? Um, and so next Sunday we'll have um, potluck lunch afterwards. Again, a reminder, as 1 Thessalonians says, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So out there I've got a sign-up sheet because I want to try and see if we can organise one or two prayer groups that we can be particularly praying for the work of the Lord in our area and beyond. So that's out there. Um, and then secondly, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. All right? So we've got an opportunity to do some more training with uh, Everyday Witnessing course, right? So that we can all have beautiful feet, okay? And then we can take our shoes and socks off and appreciate it. <laughs> so the sign-up sheet is out there as well, okay? But um, we need to keep thinking and praying about our mission to the lost uh, to drive us forward. So I bring those things to you. Okay, thanks, Peter. Well, as we come to the close of our service, we've got a great hymn to sing. Um, it was said of a certain Archbishop of Sydney that he could actually praise God while looking like he'd been sipping prune juice. <laughs> I don't know if you ever tried prune juice. Perhaps you could say prune juice to yourself and you'll get the idea. I don't know if I ever saw much of a smile on his face. But we as the people of God are always saying to God be the glory. Great things he has done. And the giving of his son should bring a smile to our face even however hard the week has been. So forget the prune juice now and stand and sing together. <laughs> Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the earth, hear his voice, praise the Lord.
closing blessing. Oh, we're back to Revelation by the look of it. Do you think that's Revelation? Sure is. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honour, power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And it's time for, ah, there's that slide. It's time for good conversation and encouragement over a cup of coffee.